many about people who are thinking more deeply and more broadly, are looking at it as it actually is, and are beginning to see it more in the international context and the relation that it has with the African uh, struggle, a uh, human rights struggle, or the struggle for human rights. And as such, we can then take it into the United Nations to bring about the freedom of these people by any means necessary. Because the enemy will use mobilization to demobilize us. Mobilization is very easy. Very, very easy. Because since we're people who are instinctively ready to respond against acts of injustice, anytime there's one little act of injustice, we can blow it up and we'll find people who come and make some mass demonstration around it. Miss Sally lost her job. Let's rally. She'll get her job back. People will come and rally. So-and-so got kicked out of school because the teacher's unjust. The unjust, the people will come and rally. They will come to rally at issues. And this is what mobilization does. It mobilizes people around issues. Those of us who are revolutionary are not concerned with issues. We're concerned with the system. The difference must be properly understood. The difference must be properly understood. Mobilization usually leads to reform action, not to revolutionary action. If we would look scientifically at the October 16th million and more march, we would see clearly that this was a mobilized event, not an organized event. We must know clearly the difference between mobilization and organization. One of the characteristics of mobilization is that it is temporary. Organization is permanent and eternal. Clear differences must be made because the unconscious can usually be captured easily around one-issue items, around mobilization items, but it's hard to catch them around organization. But these unconscious must be brought to organization. We must transform mobilization to organization. We say the enemy will come and use mobilization to demobilize us. Many brothers and sisters who've been to the Million and More March will say to you, I was there. Well, what are you doing today, my sister? I was there. There weren't too many sisters out there, but you know, with a million brothers together, you know where I had to be. I was there. Yes. <laughs> and then, of course, you find brothers. Yeah, I was there. I was there. I helped you. What are you doing today, brother? If we're not careful, we allow mobilization to become events. Family, and welcome to We Charge Colonialism. We are an organization of Pan-Africanists who are fighting for total liberation of African people in the United States from colonialism. One of the big things that we try to push is the recognition of this system being colonialism. And if you need any better example of that, you should see what's going on inside of this country today that has the whole world in shock, has the whole world protesting, but this is the norm. This is what a colonized state is. Whenever you have police violence, whenever you have a, a race of a people who are oppressed from the White House to Wall Street to our neighborhood, whenever you have a system that operates together to create that type of atmosphere, that is the condition of colonialism. So we have to fight the system as one that we are inside of and not one that is some type of abstract system that we could try to just integrate into, if that makes sense. Um, so what I want to talk about today in the um, spirit of what's going on is uh, when black liberation becomes trendy. And I mean that because right now we see black liberation being a trendy thing. Um, a lot of companies, CEOs, Fortune 500s are essentially going out and putting out these statements saying, oh, we're against racism, um, we're against police violence, we're against, or, or we're pro-Black Lives Matter. There are a lot of capitalist institutions who are now doing things to uh, basically jump on board this uh, George Floyd incident and try to use it to capitalize on their image. Because if you know anything about, you know, Wall Street, if you know anything about these Fortune 500 companies, a lot of it is just PR. The purpose of public relations to me of having a positive image, especially at those top levels, is kind of like, it, it allows you to get away with more things. You know, if, if you have this image, for example, of being race, racially progressive, then maybe we'll look the other way whenever you do things like um, don't environmental waste inside of black neighborhoods. Maybe we'll look the other way whenever you do things such as uh, provide funding to 
the police unions, you know, maybe we'll look the other way whenever you do things like that because <laughs> overall your image is one that is pro-black. That is how PR works. It's essentially to cover up whenever a company is going to do things to go beyond that type of purpose and it is to give a shield to them almost. Um, you can't say that I'm racist because hey, you know, I was down with the George Floyd protests and you know, forget the fact that I had nothing to say on a lot of other issues, forget the fact that I also have prison labor um, making my clothes or making my products, forget all of those things because, you know, I spoke up in this one incident, therefore you're going to forget the whole thing that I've been doing all this time. Um, but it's not just the companies, of course, you have the celebrities and a lot of people um, who probably ordinarily wouldn't speak out feeling emboldened. Because one thing you should learn about the way that the human mind works is that it's, it's it, whenever it comes to doing something quote unquote radical, you don't want to be the first one to do it. It's much easier to jump on board when someone else does it than it is to actually be the first one. So now that you have a lot of people protesting, more and more people feel like it's safe to say, oh, I support black lives or I, I'm against police violence. You know, these are things that could have always been said, but in this atmosphere, it's safe to say those. Things. So the question for us being the ones who are, are colonized, being the ones who are victimized has to be, is there any benefit to having black liberation be a trend? Is there any benefit to it being globally accepted? Um, and my answer to that is it depends. You know, the, 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 it depends. Is, is this going to be something that is the case for right now, you know, with the liberal media and, and the media? Or is this something that is going to continue? Is the conversation going to get deeper? Is the conversation actually going to address the things that don't aren't, aren't easily discussable? For example, it's easy to say that a cop putting his knee on the neck of a man for nine minutes is horrible. Um, killing him is horrible. Doing that in broad daylight is horrible. It's disgusting. It, it's something that we shouldn't tolerate. Now, when we talk more in nuanced terms, for example, when we say that colonization in general is terrible, the, the violence that the state enforces on people is terrible, when we say that the policies of racial oppression, both, both explicit and implicit, whenever they are achieving the same goal, is horrible, that's when the conversation gets deeper. Right now, people are okay with saying that, yeah, what happened to George Floyd was horrible. Most of those people, however, probably wouldn't be uh, feel the same about saying that, hey, every single black person that has been convicted of a crime should probably be review have their case reviewed by the system. I also question why is it that people are more appalled by the manifestations of a system rather than the actual system itself. Because we should know, for example, that police brutality is not the cause, that it's a symptom. Police brutality is a symptom of racial oppression. It's a symptom of capitalist racial oppression. It's a system of colonialism. It's a symptom of colonialism. It's a symptom of an overall issue. So if you're only bothered by the manifestations of the system, and you're not bothered by the actual system itself, that put those people into the position to oppress people for the purpose of preserving private, private property of millions of millions millions of um, dollars for millionaires if you're only concerned about the manifestations then I question your actual sincerity to the issue I question whether or not you actually want to resolve the issue or if you want to feel better while you're in a position of privilege and not feel guilty about it because let's be real if you're seeing people be brutalized the way that George Floyd was or Ahmaud Arbery was or like so many people before them if you're witnessing that it might be distasteful living in your privilege, whereas if you can just live on the system that's oppressing people without having to be confronted with the results of that system, then you might sleep easier. The problem with trends is that trends come and go, meaning they're hot one moment and the next moment they're not. Let's look in the past trends. Of course, we had uh, the trend of the Me Too movement, which is still here, but it's not really as strong as it was. We've had other trends in the past, obviously the trend of oh, we have to do right by immigrant children. Now one came and went because, once again, out of sight, out of mind. Um, and that's the issue. We're not like, going to have something concrete that can be manifested and actually re yield results. Then we have to question, what is the point of this right now? Um, but I think there is always going to be positive yields. One thing that can't be say, said, 
if what I think will happen, and that is that after this whole you know movement basically has chilled out, um, people will go on to the next thing. Um, people who are in their positions of privilege will not challenge those positions of privilege. They will not challenge the systems that actually do oppress black people so long as those systems also benefit them in some type of way. If that happens, which I do believe will happen, because history to me is the best way to predict the future, and we know that that has happened in the past. A lot of those hippies that were marching with the Black Panther Party, uh, they got real jobs, and they, be, they went into corporate America, and they now are living lives of luxury, while a lot of our comrades from the Black Panther Party are, some of them are still in jail, some of them are living on bare minimal, you know. Um, so that's happened before. Um, and if it happens again, what's going to happen is that black people will get the short end of the stick. You have to learn from the, from the history. And I particularly recommend people look at what happened in like the 60s and the 70s and how black liberation became more of a, um, more of a slogan. Whereas liberation of women actually manifested in something into something LGBT liberation that manifested into something uh, in more recent years. Um, a lot of other pockets where people were organizing, they manifested into something. But now when we say black power, we're not saying black power because we have black power. We're saying black power out of remembrance of the people who declared that we should have black power. That's something that we should question. Why is it that when we say things like that, why is it when we say black is beautiful, but black people are still bleaching their skin, black people are still putting in other colors into their eyes to try to look like someone else, you know, why is it? that those things that are taglines are not manifested with us, but for other groups that fight for similar struggles, that fight, even some fight, that fight with us for the moment, uh, those things have manifested for them. And my answer would be that those movements were being led by people who were organized, and those, those, that organization was yet going to yield results, whereas our movement quickly became... Um, Quickly, quickly became disorganized by the COINTEL Pro program and has not yet to be reorganized into a structure that is appropriate to black people. So, you know, that's really what I want to say on this is that the don't be so encouraged by the fact that everyone has something to say. Don't be so encouraged by the fact that it seems like, you know, this is a big topic on the news. Don't be so encouraged. I have to say that because a lot of us, we crave attention from the white establishment i noticed that oh yeah you're finally listening thank you for listening to me um forgetting the fact that that establishment benefits from your oppression oppression in every single way not just in america but overseas so when you understand that when you understand the reality you will stop cheering for certain things you'll stop you'll stop craving certain things you'll start more so questioning certain things and wanting having demands you know don't just march with me tell me what we're going to do to actually undo this system that has existed for over 400 years that's what i can't stand is um you got people acting like this is something new. when has america ever treated black people good what, give me a reference point when did it start when did it end because my reference point said that we went from slavery to jim crow to to mass incarceration jim crow so there's no precedent for you to feel that you have ever been inside of a situation where you were not being oppressed and understand that these are people who a lot of times are going to march with you and are going to be with you but are they going to be with you whenever it comes to actually changing the system when they benefit from that system you know don't just tell me you have white privilege and you acknowledge it what are you going to do to undo it don't just tell me that um you have a a system of white supremacy and acknowledge it what are you actually going to do to undo it and are you willing to undo it knowing that it's going to take things from white america from the establishment to undo those things all i have on this you guys i will see you all on another video